and I have, I have to say I was so struck because I saw this gentleman walking on the trail and I thought immediately, you know, he was not in high-tech walking shoes with his spandex and his iPod and, <laughs> you know, the, the typical exerciser. This was a gentleman, I mean, I'm making some judgments, but he looked like he may have been developmentally disabled. He walked with a little bit of a limp. I mean, he was someone who clearly hadn't walked a ton in his life. But there he was on your path walking. And it was just this instant thought about there is something happening in this community to really change the culture around how to make the healthy choice the easy choice. So let's, um, oh, I'm going to go through this really quickly so we can get to action. So this is our website, countyhealthrankings.org. Here's the good, good news about our website. We are now available on any device under the sun. <laughs> So um, up until this year, you couldn't access us very well on an iPad or many smartphones. You can look up the health of your county anywhere you are with any device you have. If you click on Michigan, you'll see the map for Michigan. The lighter the color of the county, the healthier, the darker the county, the unhealthier. One of the things I just want to point out about this, see those little buttons above the map? Um, you can look at data from any one of the three years. Now, just by changing that little radio button where you see 2012, you can immediately go to 2011 or 2010 if you want to compare. You can compare yourself to other counties. You can pick six counties at a time and look at them on the screen. You can print and download almost anything from our website. And if there's anything you need that you don't find easily, my name and numbers at the end of these slides and you can just call us or email us on the website and we'll get back to you and you can share on facebook or twitter <laughs> your county health rankings so if you click on the blue bar you'll see the same map for those health factors or those measures of health behaviors clinical care social and economic factors and the physical environment <laughs> and then if you click on an, any given county you'll get to your county snapshot this is Muskegon counties. I think probably most of you have seen this and I believe it's on a handout right in front of you. The snapshots are there. And um, I'm not gonna take a lot of time analyzing your snapshot because I think you've already done that. But I do wanna explain quickly what the different columns are because I think sometimes people are a little confused. So the column that says Muskegon County is the value that we have for your community. The error margin is a statistical measure called the 95% confidence interval. And that basically is um, the, where we know the true value most likely lies. I, I think that if you're not a statistician, think of this, when they give you presidential polling numbers and they say, you know, Obama's polling at 45%, I saw it this morning, 45% Obama, 45% Romney in New Hampshire. But the poll was plus or minus 5%. This is your plus or minus 5% is what the, con the error margin or the confidence interval is. And the width of that is going to be dependent on how many people we had in the sample. And so if there's a smaller sample, you'll have a larger error margin. If you have a bigger sample, a smaller error margin, generally. Um, and every piece of data you ever look at has an error margin. It's just a lot of people don't tell you what it is. <laughs> so the national benchmark is something that confuses people. And what the national benchmark is, is we look at all 3,141 counties that we have data on, and we draw the line at the 90th percentile. So kind of, I mean, I call it the A student line. So that's where the best performers of all counties in the nation are. Now it's not the average or the mean. So this is the best performers in the nation. And we had a lot of people in the first year say, we need some comparison to others in the nation. And we really wanna know, you know, how are we doing compared, compared to where the best people are doing. So that's what that measure is. It's not a benchmark that's been set by a national organization. It's purely a number that comes from all of the data that go into the rankings. 
And then the last column of data is the, the mean or the state average for Michigan. So when you look at Muskegon's numbers for each individual measure, first of all, you can compare to are we over or above how the rest of the people in our state are doing or the mean in our state. And then if you're doing better than that, then you can look at are we doing better, have we reached the point of the national benchmark? And so it really quickly gives you two standards to compare yourself against and think about where you might want to make change. And then if you scroll down um, with the scroll bar on the, uh, um, that side, <laughs> your right hand side, um, you'll see all of the data in each of those areas. The other thing, you'll notice, I don't have slides of this, but you'll notice every one of those measures is in blue. That means it's a hyperlink. And so if you click on that measure, you'll get a lot more information about what that measure is, where it comes from. We give you a map of Michigan that just um, plots that one measure. And then you can click on a place that says data and you can get a listing of every county in Michigan for that one piece of data. So if you're really drilling down and for example, looking at teen birth rate and you wanna see how you compare and you wanna see which counties in Michigan are doing really well, in terms of teen birth rate, and so maybe we want to call them and say, what are you guys doing that you know, is making your teen birth rate so low? You can get to lots more data there. So, Okay, but this is really what we're here to talk about. So the whole point of the county health rankings is that we take action to improve health. And here's what I want to affirm about what's happening in Muskegon. Look at the inside of that wheel and working together. You are clearly already doing that. Um, I, I have read about you before I came here. I have met some of you around the nation. And one of the things when I hear Muskegon that comes up in my mind is, oh, that's the place where they collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Now, I would say, I come from a community like that too. One of the challenges before you is how you integrate all your collaborations. And so I think that is, as you talk about the path, and are you on the right path, is thinking further about how you can integrate those collaborations even further. You have clearly done assessment. You have clearly set some priorities. And so I really think now what we're here to talk about is how you make sure you're choosing the best and most evidence-informed policies and programs so that you're sure you're not heading to Florida North on Highway 31 and that you're really heading towards that target that you all clearly intend to be heading towards. One of the things we've done now, if you go to the County Health Rankings website and if you haven't been there since April, I invite you to come back again, is you'll see, and as you've seen on the branding of everything, we are now the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps. So we are striving out of our project to provide you with more resources on how to advance on that path you're on and advance on in the direction you want to go. So one thing I want to make you aware of quickly is our Action Center. And if you scroll down on the website and click on the hyperlink to the Action Center, you'll come to a place where you can click on that model that I just showed you and click on any one of the steps and get to guidance about what are some specific activities along with some tools and resources to help you with those activities on each step of that journey around that take action cycle. So the first page is very general and you'll see it says start and act. And this, is, this is, happens to be the assess step. And you can read those definitions and see which better describes our community. I would suspect in your case it's ACT, which I don't have the slide for. I have the start slide. But the ACT is similar. And then you'll see some key activities and some tools. But if you go down to the bottom where it says find more tools in the Assess Needs and Resources Start Guide, you'd get into um, the deeper part of the recipe. So I, I think about this as a cook. So this is kind of the listing of the recipes that are available. And then you decide, I want to make a salad. So this is all the different salads in the recipe book. And then this is the specific salad <laughs> that you want to make with, if you go into the start guide, or this is the start guide, you get 
exactly what are the ingredients, what are the measurements, how do you mix it together. Um, you have a recipe the way my mother likes a recipe, <laughs> which is exactly, I want to know a quarter of a teaspoon. Don't just tell me to put in some ginger or cloves. Um, so it really is designed for whatever level of specificity you want. The other thing we're doing is a series of webinars on each of the steps in the action cycle. And you'll see there's two per month. The first one is a general webinar that discusses that step in the cycle. And then the second one is um, a much smaller group of people who, who log in and have a discussion and really share with each other, learn from each other. We have people from around the country sharing what are their challenges in that area and really an opportunity to pick each other's brains about how to do this work. Now, I think this is really perfect for you because you'll notice you missed the first two steps. They've already been done, but you've already done that. <laughs> so if there are those of you who are interested in, in this kind of information, the steps that I think really are more salient to where Muskegon's at are coming up over the next couple months. You register for webinars on our website. On the home page, up in the upper left-hand corner, there's a place that says webinars, and everything is free. Um, or actually brought to you by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. <laughs> so, um, as we said, I, I think you have those first two steps fairly underhand. So let's talk a little bit about choosing policies and programs, acting and evaluating. And I'm actually gonna focus more on choosing. And I think this is so salient to the uh, image of being on the right path. So we've provided you with a lot of data. The next thing we're gonna provide you with is really looking at this model and thinking about what are the evidence-informed policies and programs that will impact each of these areas. And so what you see on this slide is some examples of things we know work in each of these areas. And I'm gonna spend a little bit time drilling down into some key areas that I've learned about from talking with folks in preparation for today. So some time looking at tobacco use and diet and exercise access to care, which is one part of some of the initiatives in Healthy Grad, and then education. So at the University of Wisconsin, we have a database um, that was part of a Wisconsin-oriented project called What Works for Health, and there's the web address. And again, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has asked us to take this database and make it applicable nationally. So. Around the end of July, when you go to the County Health Roadmap site, you'll be able to get into this database. And what it is, is we have gone through the literature. We've gone through the research literature, and we've gone through the expert literature. And when I say expert literature, I mean literature that's produced by um, organizations that are credible but are not advocacy organizations. So these are like professional organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics or federal agencies such as the Centers for Disease Control or um, the Health Resource and Services Administration. So governmental or professional organizations. We've gone through literature and recommendations and we've picked out key policies and programs and then we've ranked the evidence about those. So you can see which have been studied and we have many studies to show that this is an effective policy or program. You'll see in a minute when I show you the slide, there are other places where we have some evidence. There are some studies. There are some places where we have expert opinion where for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics says this is a good thing to do but there isn't a lot of research about it. We have some marked that are insufficient evidence, and actually when we release the new database, that's gonna be split up because there's two ways that you could have insufficient evidence. One is that there's just not been much study done yet. Um, so there may be one or two small studies, but it really isn't enough to say, yeah, we know for sure this is an effective policy or program. The second way we have insufficient evidence is if the evidence is mixed and about half of it says, yes, this works, and about half of it says, no, it doesn't. Um, and then 
we have uh, a few policies and programs in here where the evidence is very clear it does not work. And so in, um, evidence of ineffectiveness is how those are coded. So this database will be available to you on the County Health Roadmap site in late July, but we are continuously updating our Wisconsin version as we get ready for that. And so um, they tell me I'm not supposed to go out and promote the Wisconsin version, especially in Michigan. <laughs> but I am. <laughs> so for those of you who are chomping at the bit and want to really dig in and look at it further, um, it's, it's here for you. So this is going to look a lot prettier when it's on the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps website, but right now, if you clicked on tobacco, this is what you would see. So you see some general categories, and then you see some specific programs, and then you see that rating scale that I talked about. And then if we were live online, you could click on any one of those blue hyperlinks again, those programs, and you would get to a page that would describe what that program is, it would describe what we know about the evidence. It would link you to the evidence in many cases. On the new site, it's also going to link you to some examples of where that program or policy has been implemented or some tools and resources for implementing that program or policy. And in the future, we also want to populate this with stories and examples from real communities. So right now, the implementation evidence is is more federal or national sources that might provide you some resources. I will say, a lot of times you click on it and you find a 150 page guidance book. Um, so just beware. But what we really want is to say, okay, let's talk about what's the most effective way to create a joint use agreement. You know, a joint use agreement is when you get an agreement with a school system or uh, another entity to use, for example, a gymnasium for community use as well as, as school use. And we know that has an impact on increasing access to physical activity and actually increasing physical activity in a community. So we don't have to start from scratch on that. Where can we find good examples um, of communities that have done joint use agreements and what is their story about what were the barriers they ran into, how did they overcome those barriers, so our desire is to really make this a very user-friendly resource. And one of the things I encourage you to do is as you look at it and see um, programs or policies that you've been working on, um, contact us or we may be contacting you to add your stories there so others can learn from your good work. So this is physical activity and nutrition. And as I listened to people last night talk about some of the place, you know, some of the work you're doing. I mean, you're doing this great work with your great walk run, and you're looking at ways to make that a sustainable, you know, every week or every month event. Um, you're looking at ways I've heard about how to build your trail system and enhance your trail system. We were also talking about school health and ways we can look at policy in schools. So some things here like um, physical activity or physical education requirements in your school, um, school fruits and vegetables gardens. I think I drove by a community garden on my way to, to the session here today. Really, again, great work. Congrats to you. How to increase fruit and vegetable availability in school lunches. So all things that I'm hearing talk about that show your community is thinking on the right path. Access to care. I know part of the Healthy Grad program is maximizing the use of community health workers. And you can see community health workers are a scientifically supported intervention. And so again, great work there. <coughs> and encouraging enrollment in Medicaid and Badger Care. And I know talking last night, a lot of work has been done in this community around that. And it's also a really specific activity in the Project Healthy Grad project that you're looking at to look at how to assure that all the children in your school districts, or your schools, are who are eligible, are enrolled in the health insurance resources that are available to them. And that has a direct link to what's happening in many of the um, recommendations around education because um, two that your Project Healthy Grad is targeting are um, how to encourage children to go on to secondary education and college tuition support programs. And so is it Muskegon Opportunity? Yes. 
um, Inc. <laughs> is looking at how to make those connections and, and help children get enrolled in Medicaid so that they can be part of your tuition incentive program to help support kids who may not have seen college as their pathway to secure that pathway. So you can see already that there's lots of things that you're doing that have evidence. Now, I know that college tuition support program has insufficient evidence, and what I really want to say about this is that doesn't mean stop. Don't do it. That means we just don't know as much about this. Study it and evaluate it closer. As I tell everyone, every scientifically supported intervention was once a good idea in somebody's mind. So while we have this focus on evidence, we also need to not squash innovation and creativity and just realize we need to, um, to measure things that we don't know um, are as effective more closely.